what are some of the key elements that you are looking for when you're actually uh, looking for a business that you think can be successful? What are some of the key elements? A um, couple of the key elements is, and I mean, some of these things are certainly neither controversial nor unique. I guess what we do is we put them together all at the same time and that's probably unique about what we do. So one of the key elements, one of the first key elements we look at is the market you're in, not the overall market, but the specific market that you're selling into. Is that going gangbusters or is it going so-so or is it actually going down the hill? Mm -hmm. Give you an example, you know, a lot of people are going into, say, fintech businesses. And we go, fintech is lovely, but it doesn't work. And why it doesn't work is because if you look at the, the profits of the five biggest banks in Europe, they have, I think, divided them by three or four in the last three years. And I just saw a report a couple of days ago that they expect uh, them to hit zero in mm -hmm. the next 12-month cycle. So in other words, the banking sector globally is in steep decline. The reason people think that fintech is a good idea is, oh, but the, the, the numbers are huge. I mean, there's like trillions of dollars. And if we just get 0.01% or something like that, we're going to be rich. And so they go into this instead of fixing a problem that really is broken, they just go in with this sort of the greed gland sort of all tuned up and go, oh my God, it's going to be huge. And that just doesn't work. So one of the unique things, and this sort of leads into the next kind of unique factor is, you know, we look at, at why the founder is there. You know, is their heart in the right place? Mm -hmm. Are they really truly passionate about this? Do they actually understand the problem? You know, I was just chatting to a girl yesterday for about five minutes. She's in the tank stream labs here where I'm sitting and she runs an addiction curation kind of business as in helping people cure their addictions and I says what got you into this and she says I've helped my mom for the last 30 years through heroin I'm going wow help. exactly wow but I said to her well then you're in a perfect position because you actually know everything that there is to know without having been inside it but you are as close as we can get to knowing everything every aspect every element of how it is to live with addiction and what may be some of the pathways out of that. Perfect. And she's already raised a significant amount of money in seed capital to get the business off the ground. But I always test for why. I always test for, you know, do you do this because it seemed like a nice idea at the time? Or do you do this because you would even do this if you had no money, if you had no time, if you were at the end of your life, you'd still be doing this. Because if it's the latter, then, okay, that's very bankable and is very backable. Mm -hmm. And that's super, super important. And the third big thing, and there's another 117 things after this, which I'll <laughs> spare you from. But the third big, big thing is we look at the business model. We look at how is your business model unique, different, special, compared to everyone else's business model that may be in the same sector. And because one of the things that we've observed is from an investing perspective and from a where do I put my money perspective and we need to look at both sides. This is not just an entrepreneurial business. We're going to find businesses that investors think are great businesses. Otherwise, you're not going to get investment in them. And, you know, as a case in point, uh, one of our clients, they run hospitality. And I think it would be fair to say that, you know, Main Street hospitality right now is pretty tough. It's mm -hmm. not easy. They got hit as everybody else did, you know, after lockdown back in March and they, they went to complete uh, what you call a takeaway trade. But luckily we started the work with them about six weeks before the whole lockdown occurred. And we started strategically working on them. We started a get to know your customer program. We started a number of other things. So literally within about 10 days, probably let's call it two weeks, they were ready to trade full on from a takeaway perspective, from a home delivery perspective, they had their own database of thousands of loyal customers. And guess what? You know, a couple of weeks ago or more than a month ago now when, when the, the restrictions eased off and they were able to take people into the venue again, they were, they had, I think, quadruple their revenue in the span of well, about two months uh, when the full lockdown was in place. Now, that's pretty good. That They weren't quite back to pre-lockdown revenue. Now that they have limited trading through the actual venue, 
um, they are getting very close to pre-lockdown revenue, which is incredible because you're still mm. going to have the four square meter rule and all that kind of stuff. And they've indeed opened a second venue two weeks ago. Wow. I mean, how many other hospitality businesses can do that in these times? And it's not because, you know, they, they are special or have some genius 17 herbs and spices that are super secret now, but they have a business model that works above and beyond all else. Right. You know, it's, it's really what's going to drive the business of the future is not your product, it's not your technology. So what's the next step after you've selected them saying, yes, you've spoken to your customers, your customers are spoke, speaking with their wallets, they're actually pulling out and buying your shit. So the reality is um, they've actually tested the marketplace before they come to you essentially and that's what you really want to see, that, it, that right. there's traction. So yeah. what, what's the next step, Mike? So the next step is, and these are not sequential, so instead of maybe next steps, they, they, the, the 17 steps that need to happen simultaneously after they go, okay, let's go, is first of all, we need to build or tune the machine that currently creates revenue, so it creates a lot more, and so it creates more revenue on more autopilot, because a lot of them are completely stuck inside the engine room building revenue, which is good, we yep. want that, but we need to extract some of that business owner's headspace out of there and actually get back up to strategy. And the, the other thing we start working on is systematizing, structuring, process orienting the business. We want everything to be a little machine or a little flywheel or a little handle. They can just crank the handle and another dollar bill comes out the other end. Now, why do we do that is we know, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know research on this that a business that is attempting to scale without having proper systems, processes, and procedures will invariably fail. And, or if not failing, it'll certainly hit some really tough times simply because the, 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 the machine can't just, you can't just hire more people that all of them don't know what they're doing. That, that's a recipe for disaster. And the third thing we start working on in that same first week is, okay, let's get you some capital. And so that's a, process that takes time the act of finding the investors is not hard you know we can all just go on linkedin type in the word investor i'm sure we can find tens of thousands of people and some of them will even accept our friendship and off we go the problem is that it's you know to get an investor on board your your business it's the know like and trust mm -hmm. and that takes time and a big part of the trust building is by every couple of weeks sending a report that says, hey, guess what we did in the last two weeks? We built more revenue, we created more joint ventures, we hired more people, we built a bit of mousetrap, please give us some money. And you keep saying that uh, eventually when you call them up a couple of months later, oh, you're the silly guy that sends all these updates. Actually, it's looking pretty good. How's the business, right? And you now build some trust, you now build some likeness with them, and it actually makes it easier. And so... Those are the three key things. They're not necessarily steps, but they're just the three key areas that we start working with the first week after somebody starts with us. Yeah. So you've, you're basically building trust as one of the steps yes. between the actual company owner and entrepreneur and the investor because they've got to work together. They've got to, they've got to both believe in each other, don't they? In other words, they're going to keep investing and the other one realizes actually investing in something that works. Sure. Uh, They've got funding, you now want to, what are the last few steps? Uh, what's the next steps after the funding? They've got the process, there's a trust between the investor and the entrepreneur, um, and things are, hum are humming nicely. What, what are your next steps after that? Well, I think the, 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 there's really just two things. There is now do what you said you were gonna do. Yeah. Because hey, we had a plan, you got the funding, everything. Well, you now are actually gonna do the plan. But obviously with a mindfulness around, well, if the circumstances change, then you're just going to change with the circumstances. If you thought you're going to expand in Singapore and you realize it's a bad idea right now, you're going to expand into person instead, whatever it might be. And, and so the, the, we got to have constant flexibility around the, the pursuit of the business plan that we, that we wrote. And I, I think the next thing is then, constantly challenging ourselves as entrepreneurs and for an hour and challenging the entrepreneurs we're working with she said well how can we do better how can we do more how can we 
push one more order in? How can we hire one more staff member this week or this month? How can we do one more country this year? And because we're going to be very careful, we're not getting into the, oh, well, it's going pretty all right, isn't it? No, it's not. It's like there is always room for improvement. There is always room for doing more. And it's not because I want to be a slave driver, but the, because the reality is that you cannot predict, you know, what's going to happen specifically to your business in X number of years. So it is really about driving the fastest possible you can, given the circumstances So people are waiting outside your door, wanting to place an order. Well, okay, let them in. doesn't matter. It's 11 PM. Take the order anyway. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just like, and that's the, flexibility that I guess comes out and it only really comes out of shine because of that passion that we talked about in the very beginning. It, yep. It's like when you have that passion, you go, all right, yeah, sure. I know it's 11 PM, but I hey, come on in. I'll take your order too. Right. And you just do one more. And it just, it might be if the restaurant who had only bumped up the revenue by a couple of hundred bucks, it could be an industrial order that extra order was worth a hundred grand. You don't know, but it's just like, it's, you know, different business and very different metrics. But it's always worth doing because, mm -hmm. you know, there, there is, um, you know, it's, it's what's, there's an old saying, if you want something to get something done, just ask a busy person. Right. <laughs> and that is so true around business ownership and entrepreneurship is the, the, the people that are the busiest, they are the luckiest too, somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not sure how that works, but there's some kind of corollary there. Yeah. 